Uh, uh, good evening, friends. Uh, uh, welcome all uh, to our institution course, uh, Mistakes and Management. Uh, this is the fourth uh, consecutive year that we are uh, conducting the same institution course that is Mistakes and Management uh, in uh, the different uh, uh, all-day ophthalmological conference. And, and uh, never uh, did we have to uh, repeat any topic. That means that uh, uh, there are a lot of areas in which uh, complications are possible in ophthalmology, and this gives us a huge uh, learning opportunity. Uh, and uh, I am uh, uh, Sri Narakwan, and uh, uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, speaking on uh, dry eye. Uh, I've uh, uh, selected this uh, top topic basically because uh, uh, dry eye is the most irritating of all uh, complaints for the patient and also for the uh, treating surgeon. See, this patient uh, came to us during the start of this present COVID lockdown. He wanted cataract surgery in his left eye because he couldn't open the shop during the lockdown and he wanted to, uh, to get over with it uh, before the lockdown is lifted. Uh, uh, he was seen by my colleague, uh, Dr. Evadi in our uh, uh, Kanjangat Hospital. And uh, uh, she saw that the patient had very severe uh, dry eye with photophobia and filamentary capillitis. And the patient also had uh, uh, severe mucosal gland infection. And I had uh, uh, done uh, cataract surgery in his uh, uh, right eye uh, about two years back, and he had severe dry eye symptoms uh, post-operatively. So Dr. Avedi started the patient on uh, uh, hot formidation, uh, lubricated drops and gel, uh, topical fluoromethylone and oral doxycycline. And, uh, even after uh, uh, treatment for about a uh, uh, week, uh, there was no significant improvement. So she added uh, uh, tacrolimus uh, ointment, 0.1% uh, BD and oral omega-3 fatty acids. And this uh, was a look uh, after about 30 days of uh, treatment. Photobio was still there, but it was decreased, chronic staining had decreased, but still there. Uh, there was a very minimal uh, TM meniscus and uh, Schremer and BUT both were uh, uh, less than five. Uh, but this patient is still insisting on uh, getting cataract surgery done. Uh, see, can we do cataract surgery now? See, I uh, made a real mistake in the other eye of not treating the dry eye for going out with the cataract surgery, but I and the patient suffered uh, for months together. And the second question is, did we make a mistake in the dry eye classification in the first place? See, uh, uh, there are basically two types of uh, uh, dry, dry eyes, uh, uh, echoes deficiency dry eye and uh, evaporative uh, dry eye. And uh, when you look at the uh, definition of dry eye by uh, due to, you can see that there are uh, two central points here. This TFRM hyperosmolarity and ocular inflammation, and uh, this is seen here. And uh, in evaporative dry eye, what happens is there is increased evaporation of uh, uh, the tear film so, so that uh, uh, the osmolarity of uh, the tears increases and uh, it triggers that uh, uh, inflammation uh, cascade. And most often it is caused by mebomine gland dysfunction. And in aqueous uh, tear deficiency dry eye, it, there is reduced tear production, uh, uh, hyperosmolarity of the tears and uh, uh, associated uh, inflammation. Also, it is basically divided into Jogren syndrome dry eye and non Jogren syndrome dry eye. Uh, and uh, 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 see, uh, to diagnose Jogren syndrome, the patient should have dry eye, uh, dry mouth, uh, uh, parotid gland enlargement, unexplained uh, increase in dental caries, abnormal ser uh, uh, serological tests, and significantly low uh, Sherman test and all. But why are uh, we really concerned about Jogren syndrome? Because it's strongly associated uh, uh, with malignancy, and Jogren's can kill, but a dry eye can't. So if you make a mistake of uh, missing Jogren syndrome in a dry eye patient, it is a huge mistake. And uh, did omega-3 fatty acids really help? Uh, studies have shown that uh, omega-3 fatty acids uh, don't really help in the treatment of uh, uh, dry eye. And was it right to use uh, tacrolimus? See, uh, uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus are the two immunosuppressants that are most commonly used in, uh, uh, topically in ophthalmology. And tacrolimus is 10 to 100 times uh, more powerful uh, than uh, tacrolimus, I mean, uh, cyclosporin. It is used twice daily for at least two, uh, eight weeks. And uh, no uh, uh, serious adverse effects have been uh, reported uh, with the uh, topical ophthalmic use of uh, tacrolimus. But there is one report of cancer and lymphoma, topical dermatological use of uh, tacrolimus. Uh, is there a role in uh, uh, topical cyclosporin in this case? So uh, uh, when, when you compare cyclosporin and ta uh, tacrolimus, uh, studies have shown that they have equal efficacy and uh, whatever minor uh, ocular adverse effects are there, they are also uh, comparable. So there is no point in uh, adding cyclosporin here. Now coming back to the question, can we do cataract surgery now? The signs and symptoms have significantly improved. But I would go ahead with uh, cataract surgery only if uh, the uh, patient becomes asymptomatic and uh, uh, the uh, stromer, tibet, everything increases, get the uh, system integration done. And if the medical management doesn't work, go ahead with uh, punctal occlusion and uh, control everything and go ahead with cataract surgery. Why? Why am I really bothered about cataract surgery? I mean, uh, dry, uh, managing dry in cataract surgery because dry is one of the main reasons for patient dissatisfaction for following cataract surgery. And this is my second patient. This is from my uh, uh, the other hospital, Thalasheri. Uh, uh, the surgery was done about 
two weeks back. Uh, on the first post of the day, the patient had severe photophobia. There was epithelial defect, uh, punctate epithelial erosion. And uh, this actually is a uh, picture uh, uh, after one week. Uh, you can see that there is a, a severe uh, anterior blepharitis. Uh, punctate staining is there, the mubermine gland dysfunction is there, severe dry is there. If my colleague who had posted this patient for cataract surgery had seen this, he would definitely not have posted this patient for cataract surgery. But so, so where, where was the mistake? Uh, see, the studies have shown that uh, anterior blepharitis wasn't significantly within a week of uh, uh, cataract surgery. So there might have been some subtle signs uh, uh, and symptoms of uh, uh, dry eye, which, uh, uh, which was not that very significant to delay cataract surgery. And after cataract surgery, this, this all got worse. So how to avoid the mistake of uh, uh, missing out on a dry eye preoperatively? Uh, uh, see, you have to listen to the patient. If the patient uh, uh, complains of irritation, forehead body sensation, tearing, burning, uh, mucus discharge, etc., uh, you should ask the patient, you should consider trying that, you should ask uh, the patient if it is worse on uh, awakening up, then it suggests acoustic deficiency. And if it uh, gets worsened as the day goes on, it suggests mebomine gland dysfunction. Ask about systemic uh, medications, uh, dry uh, mouth, gum diseases, and also look for rosacea on the face and eyelids. Uh, see if the eyelids are floppy. Look at the lid margins. There is uh, uh, mebomine gland dysfunction, uh, blepharitis, trichiasis. Uh, 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 look, look at the quality and uh, number of uh, uh, the blinks of the patient. Look out for conjunctive calysis. On slit lamp examination, you should also evaluate the alarm, uh, the, uh, film properly, the tear meniscus, look out for uh, cellular debris, mucin uh, in, the, in the tear film. And if you suspect uh, uh, dry aid, do, do all this test to confirm. So uh, uh, coming back to the treatment uh, uh, for this uh, particular individual. Uh, so for the treatment, if you uh, classify it uh, uh, in, in, in terms of severity, it falls into, uh, on based on his uh, uh, science and it falls into level three uh, of uh, uh, severe uh, dry eye. And for level three dry eye, these are the uh, treatments that are uh, advised. Uh, oral tetracycline, we are given oral doxycycline. Uh, unpreserved days, we are given that. Uh, in place of cyclosporin, we are given uh, uh, tacrolimus. So uh, if uh, it doesn't work, we'll have to go for uh, punctuplex and autologous era. So uh, what about the uh, second case? The, the post-operative case uh, has got blepharitis uh, and everything. So if, 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 if you check the literature, you can see that eyelid hygiene before and after a cataract surgery improved post-operative uh, subjective symptoms and prevented post-operative exacerbation of anterior blepharitis and uh, mebomine gland dysfunction. So uh, warm compress was given to, uh, given to the patient, lid hygiene uh, was given, lid cleaning uh, uh, was advised, oral doxycycline was uh, given, uh, antibiotic uh, uh, steroid ointment uh, was given for replication on the lid margin and uh, uh, lubricating uh, uh, gel was given. So what about the post-operative medication? That's uh, 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 post-capitrex surgery, post-operative medication. I, I shifted from uh, prednisolone acetate to uh, dexamethasone. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, everyone would agree to that. And uh, what about the uh, lubricating drops? See, we have a huge uh, number of uh, chemicals available uh, in the market uh, for managing uh, as uh, lubricating drops for managing dry air. But uh, uh, my personal uh, preference for uh, such a severe dry with epithelial defect and all is uh, gel, which is 0.3% uh, HPNC with uh, sodium perborate. And uh, that was uh, what I gave. And what about to topical NSAID, cyclobelagic, and anti glaucoma medications? See, if the patient had uh, uh, suspicion of uh, High IOP, I would uh, uh, prefer oral uh, diamox instead of uh, topical mediations so because all this uh, increase the dry eye. NSAID uh, is uh, worse. Uh, and uh, if, so if at all. all respect, I, uh, uh, I expect you to just uh, wrap up in the next No, 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 no. This, this includes the interaction also. That's okay. 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 Uh, so, and uh, if. Uh, 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 if, if at all uh, uh, irritation was there, I would uh, uh, stop. Uh, I mean, I would not give uh, uh, oral antihistaminics. And uh, basically, this is it. And uh, uh, see, before before I go to uh, our next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Kaushik, uh, uh, we have uh, two uh, two of the best uh, cornea specialists in India with us, Dr. J. K. Reddy and uh, Dr. Vanati. Uh, uh, Dr. Vanati. Um, can you can you uh, 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 please uh, uh, advise us uh, which which uh, type of tremor test uh, uh, would you prefer uh, one with uh, anesthesia or without anesthesia? Okay, uh, I would do without anesthesia. 
and uh, again shammer's test is not a very uh, reliable or a very uh, indicative test of the uh, severity of the dry eye disease except that you would really be able to assess the amount of uh, atmosphere secretion which is available in that particular patient i always rely upon the uh, the test to look for the uh, tear stability and for the ocular surface damage these two directly corroborate with the severity of the disease and the amount of conjunctival hyperemia also helps you to alert to the amount of ocular surface inflammation the patient has so you first sort of uh, quantify the amount of discomfort the patient is uh, is having because of the dry eye disease second you move on to your triaging questions and then identify the particular risk factors which causes the dry eye disease third apply the relevant diagnostics and fourth we will move on to treatment modality depending upon the level of severity of the dry eye you are looking at and and uh, uh, do you look for the uh, tear break up time yes i always do the tear break up time and the and ocular the surface of, uh, that it is 10 10 seconds or uh, uh, 15 seconds is it uh, You always keep a keep a cut off whenever it is below ten. Then you're going to get alerted, and you would again, depending on the severity, you might be seeing it as an instantaneous breakup. You could have two, you could have four. Anything below ten is what is going to alert you that this is a patient who's going to need uh, uh, intervention modalities. And commonly with an evaporative dry eye disease, then uh, that's okay. a different. Okay, okay. And, uh, JK sir. Yeah, uh, JK sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is your choice of? Uh, uh, lubricating drop you have uh, uh, different choices for uh, ectos deficiency and uh, evaporative dry eye or uh, what uh, what do you say uh, there, are, there are many things given like uh, some for uh, vision deficiency some for this one but what we found in my practice is uh, the severe dry eye i use uh, thinner the drops i don't use thick drops for the severe because the purpose of the thicker drops is retaining the aqueous available in the Uh, ocular surface. If there, there is a aqueous deficiency, not an operation, and uh, you apply a thicker drops like a one percent drop, it's going to mess up the condition. So I I go for a thinner uh, ones, point three percent like that. So if there is a aqueous a operative component is more than the deficiency component, then I go for the uh, thicker ones like point one percent. it helps a lot so remaining all you have to try a uh, trial and error each person uh, some of they like one so there is a lot of combinations available you know so that's and what about, what about what about the uh, topical steroids uh, what is your preference like fluoromethylone or lotuprednol occasionally you have to use it uh, uh, in uh, the first preference is lotuprednol that we can go for low strength then second preference is uh, fluoromethylone very rarely we go for dexamethasone once a day and and uh, 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 do you use uh, tracrolimus because uh, when i think you were one of the first persons to uh, uh, say okay this is uh, this can be used used to do you it still helps. use that uh, yeah yeah do you, do you it does it? help yes so yes. Uh, you 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 it's your choice between tracrolimus and uh, cyclosporine from uh, for mild cases cyclosporine is good enough mild inflammation in the ocular surface if there is severe inflammation definitely you need tactical so it was for me is not and and, and dr vanathi like uh, uh, for uh, oral use uh, would it be doxycycline or azithromycin or azithromycin for 3 days and continue with doxycycline and imibomin gland dysfunction uh, i always give a, a, a doxycycline uh, because it's relatively safer and when your age limit is allowing permitting you to give then uh, for uh, for older children and adults doxycycline 100 mg OD or BD for a long period of time but when you do have an obvious mebomitis sitting out there and you have other uh, uh, lid adnexa problems then uh, a short course of azithromycin always helps as well mm, and and is there any specific preference for uh, uh, there are a lot of solutions available in the market any any specific preference or any, any, any I, i think uh, as uh, dr jk rightly pointed out uh, most of them have a very similar viscosity index here and when you are looking at aqueous replacement you would like to use a low viscosity uh, agent here and you would not want it to be a more viscous here and no again, no one uh, regarding uh, the, the solution for cleaning uh, the lid margin 
uh, uh, cleaning solutions here, uh, uh, preferably we do have the, the combinations of, you know, tea tree oils or uh, you have medicated wipes which are available for, uh, right now. But what works well is uh, just do a, a, a good hot fermentation and uh, a good lid massage to express out and any or any of the uh, simple antibiotic ointments also work well as lubricants when they are in a very active stage of inflammation maybe a mild steroid as well to control and oral antibiotics. They work perfectly well. And uh, over, you know, looking at medicated wipes for cleaning the lid surface. Okay, thank you. I, I think we'll go to the uh, uh, next uh, session. The, uh, so the next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Kaushik. Uh, uh, Kaushik uh, graduated from uh, KMC uh, Mangalore and uh, did uh, DNB ophthalmology at uh, Shankara Coimbatore. Uh, and he, he completed all this uh, periodic ophthalmology and uh, services fellowship at uh, Shangana Australia. He's, he's presently the president of uh, Medical Administration Shangrai Foundation India. He's uh, an alumnus of uh, Institute and uh, completed a course on strategic management of uh, nonprofits at uh, Harvard Business School. He has collaborated with Harvard uh, School uh, of Public Health, University of Bonn, and London School of Hygiene and uh, Topic Health on various public health research projects. He's currently a member scientific committee of uh, Vision 20. 20 India and also National Chair Learning, CIA Young Indians. Uh, he has a special interest in amblyopia, rehabilitation, use of technology in uh, ophthalmology. Uh, so he'll be speaking on uh, uh, periodic eye care. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, Kaushik. I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing and uh, you can share your. Kaushik. Thanks a lot, Srini, for inviting us to be a part of this panel. I think it's a uh, double privilege when you have all your teachers with you and also is at the same time very scary that you don't want to make any more mistakes even during the course of this presentation. Uh, from that, uh, what I'm going to be sharing today is a little beyond uh, just amblyopia in terms of uh, how we follow guidelines blindly at times. And I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Dr. Saumya, Vidya, Aditya, Divakar, Dr. Amar and Dr. Sneha who helped me put together some parts of this presentation. Uh, the mistakes that I would be covering are largely mistakes in terms of communication, where we've looked at anatomy over the function, especially in amblyopia with coexisting condition, limited understanding of technology that could be used, how we get biased because of history in anomalous head postures, and how we could look beyond the obvious and correcting refraction. And the last bit is in VKC, since we had some discussion on that, uh, how we need to look uh, beyond just what we traditionally do. So looking at amblyopia, we know that it ranges between one to 6% in India. And by and large, we today follow the PEDIC guidelines, which is the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group that promotes part-time occlusion of various times based on the degree of amblyopia. However, what we are not clear is, one, is the child actually patching because you've told him to patch? How much are they patching and how well they're patching? So we look back at some of our data during the lockdown saying that the uh, children that we had advised prior to the lockdown, what were they doing? Uh, so when you looked at it, the compliance isn't too bad. Almost about two thirds of them were doing it. Uh, we usually encourage them to do some amount of near activity. We suddenly realized that about 20% of them were actually not doing that. Surprisingly, almost about 15% of children were not wearing glasses when they were occluding their eyes. So that again was a deterrent. And one parent kind of agreed saying that they they included the hours the child was sleeping as a part of the patching regimen. A lot of the parents, almost about one third of them, found that the entire regimen was not very comfortable. So the first mistake that you do often in clinic is that you communicate or advise and you assume that the parent has understood what you want them to do. So this is very imperative. Today we give a little handout to parents where we encourage them to look at it and we have now started calling them back. The second caveat is we often... Uh, ignore the potential vision in unilateral organic disease. This is something that we started looking at very early uh, with Dr. Mahesh when we had a large number of children with Coates disease who would present to the retina department like the image on the left. And by the time the Coates resolved, they would land up uh, to us looking much better. And typically we would give full cycloplegic correction. We would occlude based on the pedic protocols. And when no improvement was seen, we were increasing the patching regimen. What we realized is by bumping up the patching to about 12 hours a day, and in those children who were compliant, so these were about 13 children that we initially followed up. Currently, this cohort is about 22 children. 
we found a, a large number of them show significant vision improvement. Some of them even up to about 624 from a presenting acuity of 2 by 60 or 3 by 60. So this becomes very critical. Even in children who are not completely compliant, there was some improvement in vision and all these children did not show any regression in acuity. So the second mistake is whenever you see a coexisting condition, don't assume that the vision cannot improve. Do consider a trial of patching or amblyopia management. Conventional patching has been taught to be work in critical periods. We are always told that there is a magical cutoff at eight years before which everything has to be done. So we again started exploring, saying that if parents are so unhappy and older people are not going to be patching, can we look at binocular therapy as a primary intervention? So we came up with our own solution called Visu Prime that looks at the depth of the suppression scotoma and actually stimulates that using various modules. What we have again found in a prospective uh, study of about 34 patients, we had anecdotal reports that it worked, is that both the distance and near visual acuity gained and are regained, retained at about three months. We also found surprisingly an improvement in contrast sensitivity and almost one quarter of the patients showed an increase in stereopsis, which was a very surprising finding for us. What this shows is that dicoptic based vision therapy should be considered or can be considered even as a primary modality of treatment, especially in anisometropic amblyops in young adults. So don't assume that if the patient is older, so don't make that mistake of telling them nothing can be done. Again, be aware of what is the recent advances in technology that you can implement. We often start off our ophthalmic exam with the history. So this was a child with infantile spasm diagnosed with ROP who was undergoing sensory integration therapy at a physiotherapist who was referred to us for an anomalous head posture. So we started looking for what were the obvious things. We found a little bit of intermittent exotropia. The binocular vision test showed certain changes both in the virgins as well as in terms of accommodation. Her motility was poor. The cycloplegic refraction showed a high cylinder. In this particular child, we again ended up undercorrecting the cylinder and we put the child on some binocular vision therapy and this improved. Again, the guideline says that you should give the full cycloplegic correction, but in some of these children with withdrawal astigmatism, you're, you may be better off in undercorrecting them to achieve maximum binocularity because this then reduces some of the aberrations and helps them in correcting their vision much, much more. This again was a child that was diligently patching, followed up for almost about four years. Uh, it was a case of refractive accommodative ET. I've just grabbed some screenshots of the actual case record to show you what was happening. This child used to periodically come. He used to be patching. We used to keep reviewing every three months. But beyond a point, we found that we were hitting a plateau. At this point, we looked at getting his topography done, considering that he had a reasonable cylinder. And we found some irregularity of the cornea. This child, when shifted to a rigid glass permeable lens, suddenly showed an improvement of almost about three to four letters. So from a 6.9 that he was reading with the spectacles, he is now at about 6.9 plus three, and he has further improved. So we have now actually discontinued the patching for these children. So again, the mistake that we were doing is we often assume that the plateau has achieved, and we think that younger children cannot be given contact lenses. Where the parents are clear and the children today are extremely smart, you could consider this as an additional modality of treatment. Vernal keratoconjunctivitis forms a bulk of our practice in all our outpatient clinics. Again, we usually treat them on, on review when there is no improvement in visual acuity. It is usually at that time as an afterthought that you start looking at the refractive status. When should you do a corneal topography? Again, the guideline says minimum to high astigmatism with systemic disease or where there are surgical indications. What we've realized in children with VKC is that a large number of them actually have some amount of keratoconus that requires intervention. So a lot of these children today, even with low cylinders, we've started almost as a routine, trying to map their topography. And that has given us an additional tool in terms of solving the problem. So where there are coexisting conditions, don't be afraid to use the tools that you have. Uh, I would end my talk with this slide, especially when you're handling children, that guidelines are an aid to clinicians in their current clinical decision-making. We definitely need to move beyond eminence, but ask your teachers and mentors when in doubt, look at the current evidence that is available to you, and quite often chat with your juniors and peers, because a lot of common sense will come into play, and you may be able to overcome your mistakes. So once again, a big thank you to Srini for including me as a part of this very interesting symposium. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Kaushik, uh, for the wonderful talk. I think uh, uh, the, the previous session took away our uh, five minutes. Uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll have the discussions we have uh, at the end. And uh, uh, our, our next talk is uh, by my uh, dear teacher, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. J. Uh, J. Kennedy. Uh, everywhere I go say, uh, I, I, I say, and what I have become is just because of uh, uh, J. K. Sir and. Uh, he he is one of the best brains in ophthalmology in India and uh, in the world, and uh, uh, he is the chief surgeon uh, at and medical director at uh, uh, Shankaraya Hospital, uh, Coimbatore, and he heads the research and uh, development being at uh, uh, Shankaraya Foundation uh, India, and he has to discredit uh, three patents uh, that have been filed uh, for uh, IOL designs and character processes. He has uh, trained many, many ophthalmologists from across India in cornea and refractive surgery, and uh, he was also part of uh, an expedition to train uh, surgeons in Cambodia and uh, Nigeria. He has been a pioneer in uh, temporal SICS, DAL, use of posterior iris claw, and has worked with the uh, ophthalmic industry to innovate uh, uh, solutions uh, relevant to eye care uh, in India. Uh, and uh, sir will be speaking on uh, corneal ulcer. Uh, over to you, sir. Yes. Thank you, Srini. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your kind words. And every year we are uh, doing this one. This time we are doing virtual uh, our uh, today's symposium. Um, I think uh, uh, we need to save some time. Uh, the corneal ulcers are common mistakes in our practice. What we are seeing a lot of uh, the corneal ulcer, as you know, in India, one of the capital of uh, corneal ulcers. So uh, this, for example, uh, what is the definition of a uh, corneal ulcer? It's a discontinuation of epithelium. It doesn't specify uh, in a textbook saying that infiltrate should be there, infection should be there, nothing. They don't specify uh, a discontinuation of epithelium. For example, this particular case, if you see it, there is a small uh, uh, defective epithelial defect with a ragged margins and uh, very nicely succumbed. There is no infiltrate. You need to see, you have to look at, there is no bacteria, fungus, nothing infiltrate. But looking at these margins, a lot of people suspect a viral etiology. And when you strain it, there's a, there's a very nice pattern that extends onto the conjunctival. Whenever you see a, a conjunctival, Staining, extending onto the corneal staining, and there is no infiltrate. It should be 100%. It will be a tarsal foreign body. Somewhere it will be sitting. Sometimes we cannot see it. Uh, many times you cannot see it. Sometimes we have to decongest the eye with the help of uh, nephazole eye drops or uh, brimoridine eye drops. When you put the drops and leave it for a few minutes, then again call back the patient. Once the congenital capillary is blanched out, you can see a nice foreign body there and uh, you can remove it. Then comes the second uh, very common one is the uh, uh, different types of is the bisting. So the patient says, I'm going in a, something hit my eye. It may be insect, he's not sure. So you, next day you will come with a uh, uh, cornea like this. And if you say see carefully, you can see unless you remove the, this is not an infiltrate, you see a hypopion. So people will get uh, usually the concept is highly infected because the patient is having, this is a reaction to a hypopion to the toxins. So unless this is very small, the best thing it looks, it's very, very, very tiny. Many times we removed it, just look at small uh, hair like thing. Uh, but it's so toxic unless you remove the bis somehow you have to remove it. So take the operation the operating room and it will be deep inside the cornea. Sometimes we enter into the antechamber and from there we peel it out. It won't get resolved. And in these cases, after a, just a, a few hours of antibiotics, say five to six hours of initial antibiotics, and you have to start uh, steroids, uh, intensive steroid therapy, then it, then it is all. For example, this particular case, you see the plaque, you see this black one, this uh, hypopion. So it is all very well and regain vision, but it should be done as an emergency. If you leave it for more than 48 hours, the damage, whatever happens is uh, irreparable for the corneal endothelium. Then some cases, this is a, a simple case of marginal keratitis with a little exaggerated, but sometimes when you see this, I saw many places, many times, they diagnose as a PUK, peripheral ulcerative keratitis, and uh, do a lot of, it's a, just nothing but an exaggerated reaction all around with a uh, marginal immunity response to the 
staphylococcal antigen. So we need to treat, treat these cases with a topical antibiotic and steroids and along with oral. Uh, in this case, my preference is azithromycin, not doxycycline. They work very well and they resolve very nicely. The other one which is emerging, how to differentiate? A cornea, you see a cornea, you see the, uh, super, the superficial punctate uh, lesions. And uh, you see the lesions, they just looks like you did in a Photoshop and stuck over the cornea. It doesn't look like a real uh, SVK. If you see it like that, it's uh, mostly it is uh, not a, you are not dealing with uh, viral catheters. Uh, this is a microsporidiasis uh, most of the times. And uh, the treatment is uh, uh, very different, but uh, we are following in South India fluconazole eye drops uh, four to six times a day. It's working very well to our surprise. This is what uh, Dr. My boss, M. Srinivasan suggested, and somehow it's working. So whenever you see a lesion and they look like very quiet, the surrounding cornea is very clear. They're just stuck on the cornea here and there as though you put uh, some painting, uh, you are dealing with microsporidiasis. You can see much better in this uh, picture. Then coming to the fluorescent stain and corneal, this is the one, uh, one problem. Whenever uh, the resident stain, immediately better they take to the uh, uh, surgeon and uh, the treating surgeon. Once you stain and leave it for some time, the entire morphology of the cornea changes uh, the ulcer. The stain goes into the stroma and the entire thing will become stained up and you cannot, we cannot diagnose it. It becomes very difficult based on the morphological features of the corneal ulcer. Even at this stage, if somebody brings for me like this, I cannot say it's a fungal, early fungal or a, a dendritic arthritis. So whenever in doubt, don't stain. Show to the uh, consultant, then stain it. Don't stain first and uh, next uh, take the case to the consultant. So it becomes like this. Entirely, you cannot see, you cannot differentiate morphological features and uh, you need to do extensive scraping even then you may not find any clue. Then if you see carefully, uh, as Rini was discussing very nicely about the uh, tears problem in elderly, uh, somehow, uh, uh, as my boss told me, I am also very, uh, uh, one uh, who believes, for example, this is a linear horizontal line, if you can see, and uh, if you stain it, it will be, my elite will take up strain. The stro it will never go into the stroma. It will be only, these are keratinized epithelium. This is not a uh, uh, superficial punctate keratitis of infective or inflammatory origin. This is a keratinized epithelium, and it will be at the uh, uh, blink between the upper lid and upper lid margin, where the both uh, much, uh, meets. This particular condition, we consider it is a uh, problem with the deficiency, the vitamin deficiency, um, uh, mostly uh, 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 B-complex, uh, range of vitamins. We cannot be very specific. We have to treat them with uh, vitamins. They resolve very well. The lubricants alone will not solve this problem. And uh, this is a very nice case, uh, uh, severe keratitis. Some minor trauma patient has given history. So they diagnosed as a severe case of uh, stromal infective keratitis. Uh, so it's a nice picture when you dilate and see it, it looks uh, very funny. So I took this photograph also. So when you look beyond the cornea, there is a congestion. So in slit lamp, it doesn't help. So these cases, please look with the torchlight also, or in the daytime. This is actually a case of sclerokeratitis. There is a scleritis here, and there is a, this is a, a more a reactionary type of keratitis, the cornea, which needs a steroid, so not a, anything in etiology. So we miss when you look only at the cornea, if somebody brings in a busy day, say there is a corneal infection, keratitis, traumatic injury. So we are going to miss this type of, and uh, misdiagnose this type of conditions. So this is the patient, same patient. You see this area is there is scleritis and the other area is very quiet. So once we started and scleritis treatment patient resolved very well, responded very well. And there is a tiny uh, one uh, ulcer. This is a common one is the nocardial ulcer, which looks very nice. It mimics a fungal keratitis. And they heal very well with amic acid. This is the post-operative pictures. 
and uh, I just want to show one, this one. So you see the ulcer very nicely. And uh, okay. another one minute, okay, Srini. <laughs> uh, then this stroma will be very clear. And previously we used to believe in slick lamp. Now we got a very nice OCT. That's what I want to show you. If you see the OCT, you can see nicely in the posterior uh, portion, the elevations. So here applying the drops will not help because the drops, the antifungal drops cannot penetrate. So you need to give intracameral uh, amphotericin B. It works very well. And you have to repeat it. One, not one dose. We, what we found is you have to repeat three to four times every 48 hours. And the full strength first dose, after that we go for a half strength, full strength, giving a lot of reaction, fibrin membrane. And along with that, we found is uh, you have to give a topical NSAID like a bromifenac. We found very effective four times a day. The patients are doing very well. And these are neurotropic ulcers. Okay, I want to show one more. Uh, of course, now we got a, uh, the treatment is evolving is a photodynamic treatment for corneal ulcers. Now we are trying rose bengal with 532 light. Uh, the mistake we do here again is we just started doing this here is there is no point in trying to do this for a terminally given up case, everything gone. So when the ulcers start not responding, immediately better to do it, not to wait until the ulcer about to perforate, then do it getting perforated. You have to do the treatment at the right time. Just when you start the treatment for a bacterial ulcer within 20 for 72 hours, there is no response, then, then go for this uh, type of adjuvant treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, so uh, our, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Umesh, and uh, he is... Uh, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, Umesh uh, uh, is uh, from Shangri Hospital, uh, uh, Bangalore, uh, and he completed his MBBS uh, uh, from Mysore and uh, did uh, DNB uh, uh, DO from uh, Minto, Bangalore, and uh, then DMB from uh, uh, Shankara uh, Coimbatore. And uh, uh, he has undergone extensive training uh, in Shangri Center uh, Coimbatore and uh, cataract and refractive surgery, and uh, also from uh, Germany. He's currently the uh, chief medical officer of Shangri Hospital Bangalore and a member of the governing uh, body, Medical Administration Shangri Foundation India. Uh, he has uh, huge experience in. Uh, a large number of uh, uh, surgeries and uh, uh, he, he does a lot of uh, uh, FACO training programs and uh, he has uh, trained at least uh, uh, 100 uh, uh, fellows in uh, short-term uh, FACO training and uh, he will be uh, speaking to us uh, on uh, 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 cataract surgery mistakes, uh, basically uh, the crowded anterior chamber. Over to you, Mish. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srini. Uh, for the wonderful introduction and thanks once again for you. Uh, I just want to share. Is it visible? Am I audible? Love to see. Yeah. Yeah. See, uh, um, Cataract surgery in a crowded anterior chamber. Obviously, we all uh, uh, encounter some mistakes or the other. Very difficult to find out what mistakes we are doing. But I will try to uh, make some uh, uh, what the common mistakes that we do. All of us know the causes for uh, uh, the crowded anterior chamber. That is uh, short axial length, larger lens. Very common nowadays because of the lockdown, the intimacy and cataracts are a combination of both. But one thing that we normally miss out uh, is off late, which we are seeing, especially fast surgeons, uh, uh, when they use very high mm -hmm. fluid legs, is the intraoperative fluid misdirection. Uh, common though, common in, in the hyperopes, but can be seen in most cases. This is due to the fluid that, uh, balanced fluid that escapes through the uh, zonules and to causing uh, goes back into the vitreous and pushing the lens diaphragm. Uh, so be careful about that. Apart from the all the things, also consider this. This is what one of the common mistakes that we do. Uh, off late, we're seeing a lot. The risks of us. Uh, uh, Biometric surprises. I've had 
in the hyperops, be very careful, especially when you're dealing with uh, hyperops and multifocal lenses. I've had quite a few surprises and very unhappy patients. Luckily, it went to the minus, so no problem. Um, most of them suggest GA, if but the topicals or supplements are more than sufficient if the crowded anterior chamber is minimal. GA is very much preferable if the, there is extensive PAS and the angle flow should go from up. The role of IV minetal, as of now, I think we are all not using that much uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, the newer modalities of treatment we'll be discussing. One good thing that we have and that I have been following off late is looking at the our simple humble uh, A-scan report, uh, look at the lens thickness and the AC depth. The lens thickness, it gives us a wealth of information. You don't need to do any of the UBMs or OCTs. The, anything more than 4.5 and the AC depth less than 1.8 or 2.2, you know you're dealing with a very bad uh, uh, problem. This one. Uh, in this case, this is showing 5.8, so you know you're going to end up in some sort of a uh, GGM flag and everything. So, so, so you're mentally prepared as to how to go about it. So don't forget to see your simple, humble AS scan reports. It gives you a wealth of information and also about how to go about it. Operatively, the one thing that we normally do is obviously use uh, to uh, deepen the anterior chamber. Uh, but the risk of overfilling is always there. And most of the time, we've spent, uh, put in so much of visco that the iris starts prolapsing. So be careful about that. And the simplest thing that we forget about is try to uh, ensure there is no positive pressure, especially uh, in small car, in small eyes, where uh, deep set eyes, where there is a tight speculum and drip field. And that solves most of the problem. And we forget about this and do everything else apart from this. And this is the last thing. So make sure that you do, do that. I, for one, we are all used to cystic stones, but in, in cases where there is a shallow anterior chamber, prefer using capsular forceps and the use of side port for excess rather than the main port. In spite of knowing this, I still do the same mistakes. I'm sure most past surgeons do the same thing, uh, one of the commonest mistakes. So this is one thing that I picked up, uh, especially for the intermittent cataracts, understanding the concept of intraventricular pressure. Here, uh, uh, the, the, it's been clearly explained that the internal is not just about the anterior, it's also the posterior internal ventricular pressure. So what essentially happens is uh, when we make an opening, the uh, anterior ventricular fluid uh, comes forward and the lens is moved up and blocks the equatorial. The posterior internal ventricular remains and then we just go ahead and do the surgery and sometimes after doing a small rexis, you end up in a uh, argentina. So Keep in mind about the posterior lenticular pressure also, and how to go about that is um, is just to uh, do a small rexis and then do a bimanual uh, aspiration, rotate the view place, free the equator, uh, and the, uh, essentially loosen the posterior lenticular space, and then go ahead when it becomes very easy for you to do do extension or a double rexis. That is one of the commonest mistakes we, we do not identifying the posterior lenticular space. Um, so one other thing that we are doing here is using a small uh, 26 gauge, 27 gauge needle to uh, debulk the, uh, this is essentially for the uh, uh, intimacy cataract. And as I said, we do this for the 5 point, more than 5 or 4.8, 5.5 and, uh, and uh, lens thickness we identify in the biometry. And because it becomes very easy for us to go ahead once you do remove some amount of fluid through the this uh, This is one thing that we have been quite, doing quite often uh, nowadays, especially when we find things at uh, the uh, start, start itself. This was a case, a regular routine, normal case, uh, when we went, uh, used blue and washed the blue in a closed environment. When you use force fast surgeons, what they do is they use the, the talus fluid uh, goes and behind the vitreous and start pushing. You can see the iris uh, coming out. And uh, then I go ahead and make an opening here, thinking that it will ease out, but that will worsen the situation actually. Um, so the iris is all through and it's very tense. And that is where then we have to actually uh, take a decision what to do, because most of us try to go ahead and pull on, keep on putting visco and complicated the, the case. Uh, this is uh, typically the fluid misdirection uh, syndrome. All you need is to call your uh, retroretinal colleague. My 
uh, our pupilli uh, Dr. Mahesh just walked in, and then we went ahead and just uh, 23 gauge, uh, three port. Uh, you uh, you place a three port and uh, slightly press over here. The fluid comes out to a mild vitrectomy at the uh, uh, outlet, and immediately the AC deepens, uh, and we can go ahead and do a perfect uh, nexus and everything will go on smoothly. So the sparse plan of step, I think, is going to be a big saver for all of us, especially with the advent of 23 gauge suture less. You know, all you need is just a small opening and uh, debulk the vitreous. And in most cases, of crowded uh, uh, anterior chambers that will save, including the very bad anterior chamber uh, angle flow of blockomas, this, is, this will be a fair big help. Uh, to conclude, I think uh, uh, deepen the anterior chamber, avoid excess to deepen. One of the mistakes that we do is to avoid excess OVDs. Uh, high molecular uh, viscoelastics, viscoat versus uh, heel on. Uh, somehow I forgot to mention about this. Uh, I feel heel on is better than viscoat because using viscoat not only uh, thicken uh, the male, doing the excess slightly difficult somehow I feel so I prefer heel on over viscoat. And ensuring and understanding the balance between the anterior chamber, the intraventricular pressure, both the anterior and the posterior intraventricular pressure, and the vitreous pressure. Where you know the vitreous pressure is very high, a simple vitreous, fast uh, planar vitreous tap should be the work. Thank you. Thank you, Srin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Umesh. A uh, uh, lot of pra practical tips there. Uh, but uh, uh, we will have some, some more discussion on that. Uh, uh, past plan uh, uh, aspiration, uh, uh, I think a uh, lot of the yeah, delegates yeah. would like to know uh, about it. I mean, I will do it at the uh, end of the week. Yeah. We have uh, to, to yeah. talk right now, right now, people with us. But, and, yeah, we uh, have both Dr. Mahesh and yeah, Delay. Yeah. So uh, I think and, should... <laughs> and, and uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Mahesh Shanmugam is going to uh, give the uh, next talk. Uh, and uh, he he graduated from Stanley Medical College, uh, Madras, and completed his diploma in ophthalmology and fellowship with pitoral disease at Shanghai Natural Lyon. And uh, he has, he's uh, one of the very few uh, top uh, ophthalmologists who has a PhD in uh, uh, ophthalmology, a great achievement. And uh, he specializes in uh, medical and uh, surgical management of pitoral diseases and ocular oncology. He has uh, more than 110 publications in peer reviewed uh, journals and 15 chapters and textbooks uh, on pitoral disorders. Diseases and uh, surgery ocular oncology has been awarded the Colonel Regulatory Award uh, by the AOS, the Distinguished Ophthalmologist Gold Medal by Uttarakhand uh, Ophthalmic Society, and uh, Shivara Award by the uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, Ophthalmic Society. is uh, one of the founder, founding members of uh, the web, web based knowledge uh, forum, the Red India, and is currently uh, head of veterinary and ocular oncology uh, services of Shankaraya Hospitals uh, India. And uh, uh, he'll he'll be he'll be uh, talking to us uh, on. Uh, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Shani, for the kind introduction. Can you see my slides? My slides are visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Visible and uh, voice also. Sure, thank you. So let's look at some of the mistakes in diagnosis and management of diabetic retinopathy. This is rather a very basic talk. So here we have a patient who has come to us with some amount of decrease in vision. But when we look at the fundus inside, everything pretty much looks almost normal. So a couple of hemorrhages here and retina is fine. The blood vessels are all right. But what is important is the foveal reflex is not very obvious. So the dark reflex at the fovea is something which is not obvious. And when we investigate the patient, what we find that the patient has got quite a lot of diffuse macular edema. So this is very easy to miss, particularly for anti-segment surgeons. And we may not be able to explain the why the patient's vision is less, though the fundus looks almost normal. Of course, I wouldn't be doing an FFA in all these patients nowadays. It's an OCT is a much easier and much faster technique. So here again, you see a patient where the foveal reflex is clear. But then there is some hard exudates here. So it looks like, okay, fine. This is a patient who has come for a cataract surgery. can go ahead with the cataract surgery and we get away with it. But that's not true. Actually, what looks clinically may not be the end of the problem. So when we do an angiogram in this patient, you can once again see a lot of macular edema. So as I mentioned, any patient who is a diabetic and does have some amount of changes in the macula, better to have 
and OCT as a part of the pre cataract assessment now, so that we don't have surprises postoperatively and the patient is unhappy at the end of it all. And of course, like let's not forget the basics. Whenever they are not able to see the fundus details, the cataract is so dense that the fundus is not visible and ultrasound is preferable, particularly in diabetic patients, lest we miss a vitreous hemorrhage or a toxin retinal attachment. Once again, it will be very, very difficult to explain to the patient why the patient's vision did not improve after a cataract surgery. And macula is not the only reason why diabetic patients may lose vision. And when we are focusing on the macula, the problem may be at the disc. So a diabetic patient can have diabetic papillopathy or a non arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy, which may not look all the time like a swollen disc, like what we see here. The patient may have a pale disc because of the prior NAION or a diabetic papillopathy. And that may be the reason why the patient vision is less, but not the macula or the cataract as such. So let's not forget looking at the disc in a diabetic patient also. And when faced with a patient like this, when there is a lot of asteroid hyalosis, it's very difficult even for a retina surgeon to look into the eye and look at what is what is happening behind all this muck in the retina. So what are, we can do an OCT. OCT gives a very good picture of the macula, but if the changes on the periphery, like what we see here, some evidence of some hemorrhage is what is there, but it cannot be defined clearly on clinical examination, and, and an FFA would be the ideal way to go. Here, this shows some neovascularization with hemorrhage. So whenever there is asteroid hyalosis, this patient should be investigated further for macular changes with OCT or for peripheral changes with an angiogram. Here, again, we have a patient who probably looks like a probably a non-center involving macular edema somewhere here, but the vision is not corresponding to what we look at clinically. In that situation, again, we do an angiogram in the earlier days where it shows a macular ischemia, the enlarged four wheel vascular zone, which is much, much easier nowadays. All we have to do is an octa where we don't have to inject any dye, and that also can show a foveal vascular zone being widened and a macular ischemia being the cause of decreased vision in this patient. So here we have a patient who looks like having a circinate or rather a very large circinate and some changes happening in the macula. So is it, is it uh, diabetic macular edema? We do an angiogram, we see large pigment epithelial detachments with scarring here. So what we see here is actually the drusen and hard exudates together. The patient has wet age-related macular degeneration. The key is there are no vascular anomalies here. There are no microneurisms here indicating that the, all the problem is happening under the retina, not in the retina. So here is another patient who can be very easily mistaken to have diabetic macular edema exudates here. But what is striking is all the exudates are in the inferior portion of the retina rather than the whole of the macula. So investigating this patient, actually the patient has a macroneurism here. So a macroneurism can present like this. A branchial vein occlusion can also present like this, involving one half of the retina. So here is one patient who obviously looks like very much like a diabetic macular edema. So you see diabetic macular edema. How did the patient appear about three months back? Actually, the patient had a branchial vein occlusion. So if you notice carefully, this vein is blocked here. So a branchial vein occlusion, when it is resolving, can appear like this, like can very, very much be mistaken to be diabetic, diabetic macular edema, particularly a macular tributary vein occlusion. So we should look very, very carefully to see the other eye has diabetic changes or not, or if it is a vein occlusion. The treatment may be the same in the sense of anti of injections, but the prognosis will be different. The number of injections will be different. Here's another patient who probably doesn't look just like a diabetic macular edema. All of us can very well make out this deep blotchy hemorrhages, looks like a blood and thunder appearance, but then there is no dilated veins indicating that it's a CRVO. What this patient has is a combined retinopathy. So it has hypertension and nephropathy in addition to diabetes. That is the reason why the fundus looks like that. And control of the systemic disease gets the patient to look better. Now moving on to management of diabetic macular edema, post cataract surgery, the diabetic macular edema worsens that all of us are familiar with. So, but is it diabetic macular edema which is worsening or is there a component of CME also, assisted macular edema also? So in those situations, we can, when there's a confusion, we can do uh, an angiogram when that it can show on hot disc. If there's a hot disc, the patient probably has a component of CME also. What is the relevance? If there is an associated CME, patients do better with an intravitreal steroid rather than anti -vigil. So if it is just worsening of DME, we can give anti vegf But if there is a component of CME, then we would, the patients will do better with the intravitreal steroid also. Here is a 23-year-old lady who presents with this intraretinal fluid. Of course, her systemic parameters are 
abnormal, so do we straight away give antibiotics? Not necessarily. The patient underwent just systemic control, and you can see the intraoral fluid has gone away. So this is something which you should not forget. And again, a 23-year-old lady could be a gestational diabetes. That's also another thing which we should remember in mind. Third is if you're going to give an antibiotic in a 23-year-old lady who is possibly in the childbearing age group, that's another thing which we have to ask for, that the patient has not missed a period. Because in the first trimester and second trimester, there is no point in giving an antibiotic which can result in fetal anomalies also. So these are things which we have to keep in mind. So systemic control, all these five things have to be kept in control, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, nephropathy, anemia, and lipids. And I would not treat the patient when these parameters, hypertension, nephropathy, and anemia are grossly abnormal. I would not inject, control them, and then go ahead with injecting. Here's another lady who is 62 years old, has diabetic macular edema. Can we go ahead and give an injection? Do an OCT, the patient has a vitreo macular traction. So this ideally needs a surgery. Otherwise, the macular edema will not resolve. This is a situation which we come across very, very often, a presence of a vitreo macular traction plus a diabetic macular edema. But then we went ahead and gave an injection, and you can see the vitreo macular traction is peeled out. So whenever both are there, better to give one injection to see if it resolves the vitreo macular traction or the diabetic macular edema goes down despite the vitreo macular traction being there. And we can continue just with an antibiotic. Rarely the patient may need surgery. Another thing is vitreo papillary traction. So we are looking at traction at the macula, but traction at the disc, pulling up the disc can also cause decrease in vision by, by causing an edema within the nerve fiber layer at the disc. In those situations, a surgery like what we saw now, peeling that fibrous tissue which is pulling at the disc and making the disc edema go down will improve the vision. And vitreous hemorrhage, the studies have showed that type 1 diabetics, if there is a vitreous hemorrhage, to go ahead with the surgery immediately. But what about type 2? Most of the patients whom we see are type 2. Earlier, recommendation used to be wait for about 3 to 4 months. But then currently, there's no need to wait for 3 to 4 months. At best, at best, at best I wait for about one, 1 month and then go ahead with the surgery. And these are a couple of patients where they look like a very advanced disease with very, very poor vision, looking like as though they will not benefit with any surgery. But even in these patients doing a vitreous surgery, you can see that the patient's vision improved from 1 by 6 to 636. Another patient from count fingers to 6 by 60. To summarize, diffuse diabetic macular edema and macular ischemia may not be obvious. Imaging is essential if vision does not match the fundus findings. Not all macular edema is diabetic macular edema, and the treatment paradigm may change in these patients. Antifagif is not panacea for all DME. Systemic control is also relevant. Vitrectomy can most often restore vision even in advanced disease. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that was a great talk, and uh, uh, we'll have the discussion at the end after uh, Gobal's uh, talk. And uh, 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 the next talk is by uh, Dr. Vanati. Uh, uh, she uh, she is uh, uh, presently professor of ophthalmology, cornea, and ocular uh, surface cataract refractive surgery at uh, Dr. Api Center for Ophthalmic Sciences Ames, and uh, she is also the co-officer in charge of uh, National Eye Bank uh, Services. Uh, she did uh, the MD in ophthalmology from uh, RP Center and later uh, did her uh, senior residency there. Uh, uh, then uh, she also worked as a senior associate uh, at RP Center. She also co uh, completed uh, an international clinical fellowship in cornea from the renowned uh, SNEC, uh, Singapore in Advanced Laminal Transplants uh, of Cornea. She has uh, actually over, uh, more than uh, 100 uh, index uh, international publications has uh, contributed chapters to several uh, international subspecialty uh, uh, books uh, in a field of expertise. And uh, uh, I know because uh, she, 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 she was my senior uh, when I was doing a junior residency and she was my senior resident also. She's a wonderful teacher, a, a very passionate uh, uh, teacher. And uh, I'm sure everyone uh, will uh, benefit a lot uh, from hearing her talk today. Uh, she'll be speaking on uh, mistakes and uh, refractive uh, surgery. Uh, over to you, Vanati. Uh, Thank you, Srini, for that elaborate introduction. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah, so I think I'll just delve into the... Uh, Srini has given me a very broad uh, topic, but I'm going to largely restrict myself to the common mistakes in uh, selections uh, when you're uh, choosing your patients to do refractive surgery. No financial interest. So what are the ideal... Uh, of ideal candidates who, whom you could choose or select when you're screening your patients. 
age is an important factor. Most of us tend to rush in for refractive surgery as soon as our patients present to us. But I would largely recommend that you wait till the age of 21 when the refractive error stabilizes, when the ocular growth stabilizes. Until and unless, of course, we do see a lot of youngsters walking in for the purpose of uh, taking in job interviews where they want their glasses removed. Yeah. So you have to be cautious in such patients here. In such patients, always check that uh, their refractive error is stable. That's another common mistake which is done that you do not check how the refractive error has stabilized. We commonly look at the power of the glasses they're wearing and we look at our refractive refraction findings. And if there is a, a variation of over 0.5 diopter cylinder and in the sphere, we always ask them to come back to repeat a, a consecutive refraction three months later. And we do stick on to two consecutive refractive uh, findings being similar. So that's another way where you can avoid errors in the amount of correction you're planning to do. Uh, always remember to take off the contact lenses. So if a patient is a contact lens user whom they commonly are, then uh, would recommend at least 10 days off their lenses if they're soft lenses and about two weeks if they are hard lenses. So don't forget that. That's a common thing. Your topography would probably not be exactly reflective of the correction which you need to be doing. Again, if you're looking at women in their childbearing age group, then uh, where hormonal changes are, are going to be occurring, then those are not likely candidates and do, do not plan refractive surgeries in that uh, stage of uh, life for them here. Yeah. Again, look at the realistic expectations of patients. This is the commonest error and uh, uh, we always try to give them a wow factor. I always say in refractive surgery, you always do not overpromise, but to under promise and promise and overperform, your uh, mistakes will be much much lesser here. So let's look at the common uh, uh, common uh, mistakes which we do when we are uh, taking eliciting history is missing out a history of corneal problems either in the patient or in their siblings or in their family here. Sometimes it's very difficult for them to when you just straight away ask them a direct question if they have corneal pathologies. Indirect questions like the, the cylinder power of their glasses, frequency of change in glasses, uh, symptoms pertaining to dry eye will give you a good idea of the corneal morbidities here. When you find a suspicious topography, just do not rush. Uh, sometimes you might overdiagnose and you might uh, send away patients who are probably suitable candidates. So perform other uh, tests which would be helpful like uh, a retinoscopy to look at the scissoring reflex and look at the myers and a simple keratometry irregular myers would be subtle signs that uh, subtle signs that this is an early ectasia looking at. Look at refractive stability, as I told you heard earlier, along with early signs of corneal ectasia and differential pachymetry. So failing to look at these would probably take in a candidate who's not an ideal one or will uh, end up refusing a candidate who probably would have benefited from refractive surgery. On topographic evaluation, look at the absolute scales which are set for the various parameter. That's another common error. A simple example here is when you're looking at the anterior curvature, it looks like an anterior steepening here. But take a good look at the, the scales which are present out over here. So when you reduce your absolute scales to much lesser differences, you will have subtle differences much more highlighted than when you want here. So a recommended scale is about 1, 1 1.5 diopters when you're looking at curvature changes here. I'll come back to you in the subsequent slides on how you will have to, how we will go about evaluating residual stromal bed thickness. And this is one of the important factors too, uh, when you look at the screening factors for ectasias. The pupillary size is commonly missed, as is the ocular dominance. Ocular dominance is important when you're planning breast biopic refractive surgeries. That's more advanced, so we'll not go into that. But looking at the pupillary size, especially for myopic ablations, myopes tend to have larger pupils. So when you have more than average size pupils, more than 5.5 here, you would want to run your patient through an abrometer to look at the amount of aberrations. And if they're higher order aberrations, these are going to be very unhappy patients if you land up doing refractive corrections for some for them. So that's something you need to, you should not miss here. And when you're having larger pupils, 
do run an aberrometry and if the it's only a largely a lower order aberrations you're safe but if you have a large amount of higher order aberrations remember that uh, you will need to do a, you know probably avoid doing plano lasix and plan custom lasix and if you do have your hoa is much higher over 0.4 then these patients are, are better not done uh, not corrected using a keratorefractive corrective procedure here uh, closely look on the slit lamp examination because what is missed is this subtle epithelial dystrophies of the cornea and our recurrent erosions, which could be telltale signs of the existence of anterior corneal dystrophies. And in such cases, um, it is largely good enough to, you know, to consider these patients for a PRK, or you would be looking at a postoperative problem of epithelial healing when you take up these cases. Other corneal morbidities or other diseases, local diseases like dry eye diseases. Do not miss them because they are going to be a, a hell if you if you do a miss out amoebomyitis or bad blepharitis. The postoperative phase tends to be more uh, problematic for these patients. Of course, systemic diseases, wherever there's an immune compromisation like diabetes, autoimmune, collagen vascular diseases are going to impair the postoperative wound healing. Something which is commonly missed is if you're looking at patients who are taking uh, drugs like sumitriptan, isoretinoin, these drugs are all going to be resulting in uh, and ocular surface drying and antihistaminics as well. So again, do not uh, do not fail to look at these procedures. Large pupils, one other aspect is when you're looking at a large angle kappa and refractive surgeries. So the angle between the pupillary and the visual axis, if it is higher, and if your ablation is also going to be higher, then uh, decentration is going to be a particular aspect. This is a one particular common mistake, which is definitely, uh, which, is, which is commonly seen in uh, people who just start refractive surgery. So do take care of that, because largely we do pupil-centered ablations in most of our patients here. Tear film examinations are something which you would never miss out doing on any per patient, especially if you're planning surface ablative procedures. And of course, avoid human errors in um, in performing any, any of the refractive screening methods. Four tests which always will avoid any mistakes or which is commonly looked at is missing an inferior corneal steepening, missing skewing axis, subtle skewing of the aspects, and missing telltale signs of irregular astigmatism. And in topography, Failure to look at the uh, anterior corneal curvature along with the posterior corneal curvature. This would help you to, to, to sift out those patients which are at risk of ectasia. And when tomography alone does not help, combine it along with corneal epithelial thickness mapping. Of course, we have Corvus with us nowadays, so we, where we could look at the corneal biomechanics as well. This is a simple example of how epithelial thickness is going to help here. You look, look at the anterior corneal curvature looking largely and normal for this patient, but if you have missed out looking at the posterior corneal curvature, you can look at a large central area of, uh, of increased elevation, which is uh, an early sign of a keratoconus, and then a corneal thickness mapping shows uh, uh, clearly shows a decentered area of epithelial th epithelial thinning here, which is coinciding with the early area region of uh, uh, where the cone is probably the ectasia is going to occur, and such epithelial uh, thinnings probably unmasking or masking. Uh, uh, corneal curvature changes here. So that's when in suspicious cases, you would need to look at the uh, the epithelial thickness as well. Be aware and commonly is uh, when you counsel patients, the uh, surgeons tend to miss out what is the refractive range of correction which is present in your patients and always calculate the, uh, the post-operative keratometry in your patients. The residual bed thickness to be less than, uh, to be greater than 250 microns here. We do have some other subtle things, but in uh, interest of time, I did have uh, put in a few clinical scenarios as well. But if you have uh, if you have uh, more questions, I think it would be largely pertaining to, uh, to clear doubts on the questions wow. subsequently. And uh, I think I'll close here, Srini, in the interest of time. Thank you again. Uh, uh, thank you, Vanathi. Uh, I think we'll take the questions after uh, Gobal's uh, talk. Uh, uh, the next uh, the next talk is by uh, uh, Gobal. Okay. Okay. Gobal, okay. Gobal probably okay. doesn't need any uh, introduction, and uh, is this uh, one of the most dynam dynamic uh, uh, retinal surgeons in India? Okay, Gobal. Uh, okay, so mistakes in the diagnosis of sudden loss of vision is what we are looking at. You'll never learn if you don't make a mistake. And let's look at these prob contents and we should look at uh, uh, the problems. Many times incomplete history taking, missing drug history, allergy history, trauma history, etc. can cause a problem. 
incomplete examination is another major issue. Misdiagnosing a hypertensive retinopathy basically by not checking blood pressure in a in an ophthalmic setting is very common. Like uh, we don't do a lot of you know systemic examination, which is complete. That is a major problem. A lot of lot of people do incomplete anterior seg segment evaluation, jumping into conclusion with history and then going on, not checking pupils before dilatation and uh, diagnosis. Uh, you know, somebody has referred a patient with a particular diagnosis and you switch off your brain and use the same diagnosis to treat is a major grave problem. You know, sometimes looking at a CRVO or a vascular block, directly ordering an MRI, getting a battery of investigations and then finally, uh, you know, coming out with some diagnosis is another issue. Now, with this introduction, let's come to some causes of some of the, you know, sudden loss of vision. And uh, um, uh, then let us look at uh, uh, the uh, things. So it could be painful or painless. These are some of the, you know, sudden painless causes of vision, like subluxation of lens, diabetic macular edema, uh, with hemorrhage, CSR, CRAO, CRBO, detachment, etc. So let us look at it one by one. In a subluxated lens, you may miss out a family history in which you can have an autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive problem. Missing early mild subluxation may actually delay our diagnosis. Systemic problems sometimes are very, very important, like homocystinemia can have you know, vascular occlusions elsewhere, may, may come with a stroke. Marfan syndrome also has a lot of heart issues, uh, musculoskeletal issues, which we should not be missing. Sometimes in the presence of a subluxation of lens, missing alternate pathology can actually uh, be a problem. And IOL power calculations also. Uh, diabetes I'm just leaving because uh, uh, my um, uh, MPSR had talked about this. Vitreous hemorrhage, you know, there could be a bleeding diathesis. A systemic history should be asked very clearly. Uh, probably there's a platelet deficiency or even a functional deficiency. There may be a drug history. Uh, sometimes flashes and floaters, a simple history of flashes and floaters may tell us that the vitreous hemorrhage is not a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage, but a retinal tear or a retinal detachment. Sometimes in bleed, underlying cause cannot be seen, which should be picked up in ultrasound. And uh, sometimes with the presence of a vitreous hemorrhage, we would not know whether there is a subretinal hemorrhage or a preretinal hemorrhage. A submacular hemorrhage requires an urgent intervention, whereas a preretinal hemorrhage can wait for about a month. Sometimes you fail to measure the IOP, there could be uh, high pressures, etc. A central serous retinopathy can sometimes be missed in a patient with uh, uh, you know, mild CSR. And uh, sometimes what can happen is you diagnose it as a CSR, but actually it is a retinal detachment inferior. You should always take drug or steroid history, not miss on any you know, uh, not so commonly prescribed powder or lehium or something like that. Sometimes uveitis may be missed and it is not actually a CSR, but a sensory neural detachment because of some other thing, either a uveitic sensory neural detachment or a congenital problem with the disc causing these things. In a central retinal artery occlusion, in early CRIO, there will not be any cherry red spot and you may miss it. And there will be only pallor of the vessels. Pupils have to be looked at. Cause of CRIO needs to be uh, found out and otherwise there may be a stroke in evolution coming out. Missing systemic uh, problems here may actually prove very costly. And central retinal vein occlusion, in the absence of hemorrhages, may be missed. You may have only a macular edema. You may mistake it for a cystoid macular edema. Or an old CRVO, sometimes with low decrease of vision, we may not even know that it is an old CRVO because the vessels and the hemorrhages may have become normal. In TRV or vitreous hemorrhage, it may be a little difficult to pick up CRVOs. We should have a differentiation between ischemic versus non-ischemic and not, uh, you know, miss, not uh, uh, MVA and WinBG, we should not miss. Retinal detachment, sometimes if it is in the temporal periphery or in the nasal periphery or somewhere like that, it can be missed if you do not do a proper indirect ophthalmoscopy. There could be a one or two tears which may be missed. If you find one tear, you label the tear, you are happy, but look always for a second tear. You can miss a choroidal detachment. You should always differentiate the like sedative versus retinatogenous, and duration and prognosis are always uh, linked. Choroidal neovascular membrane, you can uh, miss it if it is uh, if there is no hemorrhage. If there is just a small PED, you may miss it. The cause of the CMVM, we should find out because it is important for prognosis. 
okay there are a lot of mistakes like dme rvo csr chloride is all can be mistaken uh, uh, another thing that we have to find out is healed or active okay, that is also very important sometimes monocular sudden painless loss of vision can occur because of systemic conditions like uh, stroke or something like that that also needs to be evaluated now what are the painful sudden loss of vision these are some of the painful sudden loss of vision in keratitis cause of keratitis inflammatory versus infective these uh, decisions have to be made etiological organism there could be a confusion sometimes in presence of mixed infections ankle closure glaucoma sometimes you can even miss the acg pupil request to be evaluated sometimes iop is not measured gonioscopy should be done in all patients and ruling out secondary ankle closure glaucoma like uh, uh, vkh or something like that also needs to be looked at uh if you do a cursory examination for a red eye with a torch light you can actually miss uveitis type of uveitis extent of uveitis and diagnosis of uveitis needs to be clearly looked at and healed or active that that decides the treatment that you will give history is so important in uveitis that you have to pick up a lot of things orbital cellulitis again infective versus immunologic and cause you have to pick up uh, you know cavernous sinus thrombosis etc there could be imaging errors which will happen here in a case of blunt trauma you can miss a traumatic optic neuropathy especially in a systemic setting where the patient is having head injury etc uh, you know you can miss angle recession or miss retinal dialysis so it's always important in these blunt trauma patients to call the patient that maybe after a couple of weeks once the you know settle once it settles down to look for all this optic nerve diseases missing Uh, optic neuritis versus arthritic AO, and the pathology needs to be found out. Demyelination versus ischemia. If it is not typical optic neuritis, we should find out why and how. Papillary edema not to be mistaken. So anatomical localization and pathological process is important. In the left, you can see an ocular ischemic syndrome, whereas other side is ocular apex syndrome. The differences in anatomical localization and pathological processes actually gives us a significant. Sometimes these may start separately, like in a mechanical injury, it's easily seen, but after it heals and scars, sometimes you may not be able to actually see. Color-coded diagnostic algorithm is completely prone to error. There are certain people who look at morphological diagnosis. You require a systemic diagnosis rather than morphology. So yellow means this, red means that, this is that, that is. So you need to look at the pathology actually. Now let's look at some binocular causes. Whenever you have binocular sudden painless loss of vision, we should always look for any systemic issues. Maybe methanol poisoning, drug drug involvement, neuroretinitis, occipital seizures, or even pituitary apoplexy, migraine, and psychological. So the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know, and uh, this is what uh, uh, it is. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Gobal. Uh, I, th- I think if we have uh, a little bit of time, uh, since Gobal is there, uh, Mahesh is there, uh, Vanti is there, uh, we'll just take uh, one question uh, that Umesh's uh, 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 idea of uh, uh, doing a vitrectomy, anterior vitrectomy, if there is fluid misdirection. Uh, so, is there, say, for, for, for a, uh, there are a lot of uh, general ophthalmologists attending, so, so for them, they might not have a, a, a surgeon with them. You have the fluid misdirection, and uh, see uh, uh, the whole facial surgery is done. Uh, you have the beautiful PC there, and that is bulging, and uh, uh, the lens is open. Uh, so, is it advisable uh, to poke a needle? See, uh, there is a, a potential space because there, uh, there are a lot of studies which say it is quite safe. Uh, uh, there is a potential burger space uh, behind the PC. Uh, that is where uh, the fluid actually collects. So, you you're not. I mean, you can't actually point it exactly at that point, but uh, is it okay, uh, or is uh, you just close the patient and uh, uh, try mannitol and uh, call the patient after some time? Uh, Gopal, I would uh, like uh, Mahesh sir's opinion first. Basically, I don't have any problem in a sharp instrument going inside the eye through the pipe planner and uh, going inside somewhere. but the problem is it's a completely blind procedure when you are sucking there's a problem if it is about the sharp instrument going through the pipe planner just behind the lens and supporting it or maybe you know giving a little bit of tug upwards so that it doesn't fall down and all it's okay but the moment you suck out 
if you need to suck out it has to be a 22 gauge or 21 gauge needle nothing will come out of a 26 gauge needle so if you're sucking out the 21 gauge needle whatever burger space you are seeing you are not seeing it and probably you are going to end up sucking a lot of vitreous which will not cause anything then but it will induce a pvd and that unnatural pvd has a 10 times more incidence of creating a tear this is my thought process I agree, so Gopal. the final hey, result would be you, uh, for for end of uh, and all for vitreous it won't come with 26 g needle but will the, the fluid that has gone there uh, will come out with a 26 g needle that's a, uh, that's a question uh, mahesh sir yeah, it can come out. Actually, if you saw the video Dr. Umesh was showing also, actually, I didn't suck anything. I just put the trocar cannula and it's a valve cannula just pressed at the tip so that liquid which just came out. So it is possible if you're not sucking actively, it may be okay. But the issue is like at what stage of cataract surgery you're doing. If a large amount of the nucleus is still there and you're not able to see what's happening behind, there's a possibility of us rupturing the posterior capsule and making it a little worse also. The other thing is, like, if you were to direct it into the mid vitreous cavity, there is a possibility you may tap that vitreous pocket or you may not tap the vitreous pocket. But coming anteriorly close to the PC would, would be a little bit uh, scary because, like, as I mentioned, you're already having a complicated situation and it may rupture and the lens may go inside. So it is okay to put a 26 gauge needle, but I would not suck actively. If at all, you remove the plunger or you keep a finger on the plunger so that, like, you just go inside, some amount of fluid comes out, just about enough. If you see that, I didn't. I, I did a vitrectomy with the probe, uh, like with the tips being seen inside. So blind procedure is to be avoided. But if you're not actively sucking and some amount of the liquid which is comes, then it should be okay. No, no, no. Most most of the times it happens at the end of the surgery. Everything is over. It it is just a PC, and then uh, then probably you can actually see the uh, needle also, right? Yeah. What I would do is like keep the bevel facing towards the uh, towards the posterior pole, towards the so that like it doesn't actually uh, like suck in the PC accidentally. So if you're able to see the needle inside, and if you're able to go to that uh, uh, like post uh, PC space with the bevel facing down, then that tap you may be able to tap that liquid which is uh, caught there. Uh, one thing, your opinion? I think uh, I have to agree with the experts here. They know better than me. I'm more of an anti segment surgeon always, and prefer to stay within my boundaries. Jacob. <laughs> uh, uh, See, Usually, we were doing it now and then, not very often, uh, once in a two years or once in a maybe three years, suddenly surprise comes, uh, uh, like you are telling. Most of the times at the end of the surgery, we are uh, uh, doing 26, uh, 24, uh, Prabhu, say, Prabhu is using 24. I tried uh, initially 24, but uh, for the past four years, five years, two or three times, I used 26. Uh, with 26 also, we are getting some some fluid out. So it may not be vitreous, it may be fluid. Yes. Mm, but we have to use, we are sucking. Uh, but next time I will try 24 without sucking. As no, sucking just, said. Just we just put the needle right. and leave and see what happens. If it, nothing happens, then we have to suck it. Uh, but 24, I think we need a passive coming out. Uh, uh, but uh, there is a problem, but we have to get it off. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a few cases. Uh, not doing also. Okay, yes, yeah. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Long time back, you know, uh, initially, I mean, 20, 25 years back when we started the early days of our surgery, almost anti chamber flat, we had to do ECC those days, you know, uh, almost 30, 35 years back when we don't have a nearby any vitreous retina surgeon. Not only institute, you don't find him 100 kilometers within you. Those days we used to, uh, before surgery, starting surgery itself, uh, we used to put a 24 through pars planner and uh, suck and do it as Dr. As Dr. Gopal has rightly said, maybe they might have had detachments after six months, seven months. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, Omesh? Yeah, see, uh, the question is, we're not doing, especially if the push is very bad. Uh, when you know that when the diaphragm, iris, uh, lens diaphragm, when it pushes uh, very bad or when the pressure is very high, there is a significant complication of suprapyrrhoidal hemorrhage also. Possibly interfering, see, it's a twin-edged sword. Uh, doing, uh, not doing, and doing. Uh, what we have seen, uh, Dr. Mahesh sir also, uh, as rightly said, there was no sucking at all. 
you just make a make a deposit on the 3 gate stroker make a entry and whatever comes out just to a mild vitrectomy i think that is serving the purpose as long as the pressure is released from the posterior vitreous side i think the work is done so if you limit yourself to that uh, that should be good uh, as long as uh, you can avoid this preparatory hemorrhage also and uh, we did have one bad case of supercoronary hemorrhage not interfering Uh, yeah, excellent. Really, like uh, uh, you have to rule out uh, uh, supracranial hemorrhage uh, before you put in the lead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in, in anything more more to be discussed? Uh, I think we. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Time we, is we, so much for. See what what what. Global, can you take a uh, photograph? Yeah. All of us are online. Yes. Yeah. Great. Took one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much to our speakers for such a great meeting. Thank you all. 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 Th